In 2003, in Hong Kong, there's a doctor from Guangdong province in southern China, and he was visiting Hong Kong. And he checked into a hotel in Hong Kong, it's a very nice hotel called the Metropole Hotel. What was not known at the time is that he had been taking care of people in southern China where there was an outbreak of respiratory disease, of, of pneumonia. That was not known at the time. Well, he had become infected and he was carrying the virus that caused that disease. Again, nobody knew that at the time. He stayed at the hotel for a few days and he checked out and then the other guests checked out. They went to the airport, they got on airplanes, they continued their travels. Some of them went home. Within three weeks, people were sick and dying of that disease, not only in Hong Kong, but in Vietnam, Singapore, Ireland, and Canada. That disease, which had previously been unknown, was called Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome, or SARS. Within four weeks after that, that disease had appeared in Australia, Brazil, Bulgaria, Canada, China, Taiwan, France, Germany, Indonesia, Italy, Japan, Kuwait, Malaysia, Mongolia, the Philippines, Korea, Romania, Singapore, South Africa, Spain, Sweden, Switzerland, Thailand, the United Kingdom, the United States. Within four weeks, from seven weeks, from one doctor staying in one hotel in one city in seven weeks, that disease had spread around the world. Not in four years, not in two decades like the bubonic plague, not even in the six months that spread that disease in seven weeks. Fortunately, although that disease had a severe impact, fortunately, it was not as contagious as the influenza that spread in 1918. And it, it was controlled, and you haven't heard much about that because we had control measures in place. But again, part of the reason was it wasn't as contagious and it wasn't as severe. The word is virulent. For most people who got that disease, it wasn't as bad as the 1918 flu. So we were lucky. We were very lucky. And that's why there's so much concern today and has been for several years about, what you, about what's been called bird flu. Because the bird flu, or avian influenza, has a lot of things in common with the 1918 flu virus. We've been very fortunate because that still circulates mostly around birds. It, it is not yet mutated to the point that it can be spread from person to person like the 1918 flu. The very few people that have gotten sick with the bird flu got it in countries where they have uh, farms and there's a lack of hygiene on those farms and they're uh, inhaling the uh, feces of the birds and working with the birds. But it can't be spread by person to person. So we're very lucky about that. But your expectation, and you have every right to expect that, is that if there was something of that seriousness, something that even approached the severity of the 1918 flu, we'd be ready to deal with it. And we're certainly much more ready than we were even 10 years ago. We've learned a lot from the anthrax outbreak in 2001, and so spurred on by the fear of bioterrorism and what we've learned about natural disasters and naturally occurring illnesses. We've tried to upgrade the whole health system to the 21st century. But I'll tell you that although you go into doctor's offices now and there are computers, and some doctors are experimenting with email, the health system as a whole is one of the most electronically and computer backward parts of our society. It has been a tremendous struggle to get the health system into the 21st century. We're working hard on that at CDC. We have plunged into the world of the internet, mobile technologies, texting, RSS feeds, podcasts, social networks, virtual reality, and blogging. 
CDC has, a, uh, has avatars on something called Second Life. Some of you may be familiar with that. It's a virtual reality universe. We, have, we do podcasts. We have blogs. We're trying to learn. We're trying to learn the stuff that you guys take for granted. We call that public health 2.0, and it's based on the idea of Web 2.0. And part of what's behind Web 2.0 is this notion of how differently people about, feel about their health today than ever before in history. People want to participate in their health. They have gotten away from what we used to call, even 30 years ago, it's called the expert model, in which we just told you what to do. Public health people told you what to do. Your doctor told you what to do. And people weren't supposed to ask questions. Doctor's the expert. Public health people are the expert. That doesn't cut it anymore. That doesn't cut it. People want to participate in decisions about their own health, and they want to participate in decisions about their community's health. And the only way that you can do that, the only way that you can do that is by linking people with all of these information tools that are at our disposal. And we are pushing as hard as we can to get the entire health system up and running into this world of Web 2.0. And we're making tremendous progress. But we need help. We need help from your generation. You guys know this stuff like the back of your hands. We need you involved. Now, hopefully some of you will go into medicine or nursing or the health professions. Some of you may even go into public health. But whatever you're in, you will have a very important role in making decisions about health for the next 10 or 20 or 30 years. And you're going to have to participate in those decisions. The more you participate, the better those decisions are going to be. You need to get interested. You need to get informed. And then you need to get involved. It doesn't matter whether you're in the health professions or not, it doesn't matter whether you're in public health or not. You got to figure out what you want the health system and public health to do. And we have to listen to you. Because all your voices now are linked together on the internet, on social networking sites. And that is the future of public health. Not the expert model, not a top-down model. It literally is now bottom up. And part of what's going to happen is that you are going to take charge of not only your own health, but your friend's health and your family's health. There's a doctor by the name of Nicholas Christakis at Harvard School of Public Health who's done some absolutely fascinating work about social networks. And one of the things that he found, he's done a couple of studies. One is on obesity and people who are overweight, and another was on smoking who smokes and who doesn't smoke. And what he found was, contrary to what we used to think, your relationships with people in your social network, as you define it, including people in social networking sites, people who you actually have never met in person, have as much impact on your body mass, on your weight, on your decision whether or not to smoke, as your family, your genetics, your community. We are all tied into these extraordinary social networks. You know that better than I am, better than I do. And that is the future of public health, where we are all becoming responsible for our own health and each other's health, not the experts. And there's a lot of opinions out there. As consumers, you're going to have to learn everything you can learn about all the stuff people are going to throw at you. This product and that product and weight loss and this tastes good and that tastes good and use this and, you know, buy this thing and you'll lose 40 pounds or buy this thing and you'll run faster or jump high. You're going to have to make those decisions. You have to get informed. And you're going to have to be part of your community, however you define that community. Maybe it's the city. Maybe it's a community like you have now on the Forum Council, that's a community. Or it may be a community that you have on a social networking site of people that you haven't even met. But your interaction with them is going to help determine 